Hey, sophomores, how's it going? Let's get into our vocab for chapter 21. And our first word is Italian Peninsula. So Italian Peninsula would be basically the modern day country of Italy that looks like a boot. Uh, before this era, era five from 1750 to 1900, Italy was not a country. There were many different civilizations that existed in Italy, many different city-states that people identified with. In fact, people in Italy identified more with their region than with being Italian as a whole country. This will change as Italy will become united and will become a country in this era. Deism or Deus believe in God. They believe that God basically set up our universe, kind of like a clockmaker builds a clock, sets it, and then the clock starts working. However, deists don't believe in basically miracles. Um, they believe that we have our own principles, that we should follow ethical decisions, we should make the right decisions of right or wrong, and that there may be some kind of um, payment for that in the afterlife, maybe not. However, basically, deists think that they don't know the name of God. That's incomprehensible to them. They believe that God exists, but they don't believe necessarily in a certain religion. They believe that God exists, God planned the world, and God just kind of leaves it alone and lets us basically live with the laws that God would make. So basically, in deism, that God basically made, you know, all the world, all the gravity, everything we have, and it's based on reason, but... They reject the idea that God interacts or comes in and has, interacts with our world. Let's go to our next word. Romanticism is a literature movement that started in Europe in our modern era from uh, 1750 to 1900. And it was an era that really emphasized the individual, inspiration, the individual being out there and do, be able to do amazing and incredible things. Um, that was flourishing this time in Europe. The salons in the Enlightenment were not places to get your hair done. The salons in the Enlightenment were places where intellectuals could come together and could talk about ideas in Europe. These mainly started in France, and they included both men and women, where they were able to have discussions about science, uh, philosophy, and other educational ideas. The first, second, and third estates. These were basically the class system that existed in France and with their estates general, which was basically the representation or their advisors to the king. 1% was the Catholic clergy. Uh, the second one, 2% was the nobility, people with titles who owned land. These are people who owned land or also involved in the church with the Catholic clergy. And 97% was everybody else. In the Estates General, which was the voting block of people who advised the king, each of these estates got one vote. And in almost all circumstances, the clergy and nobility voted together, so everybody else basically wasn't given power. And this will lead to a revolution, as we see here, the first estate, second estate, basically people in the French Revolution would have said that they were taking advantage of most of the common people, and if you look at this graph, it's pretty easy to see that with 97% being in the third estate. The bourgeoisie in France were seen as people who were materialistic, like their goods, were wealthy. These were basically the owners of the new factories that began in the uh, time period of the Industrial Revolution. So the bourgeoisie, by owning the factories, um, and by having more power was able to become stronger than many people. They are more wealthy. They weren't nobles, but because they were able to get a lot of wealth, they were even able to pass a lot of the nobles and wealth and become even more important than them. So this would be kind of like um, uh, the new rich people who come when there becomes more factories in the Industrial Revolution, which we'll be talking about in our next chapter. The Tennis Court Oath. This basically took place and really launched the French Revolution. Uh, this was pretty much when the Estates General was going to lose its power, and basically the 97% or the people, the representatives of the Third Estate, went into a tennis court and said, basically, we are going to start our own government that's going to represent more of the people than just the nobility, the clergy, and especially not the king 
in France. This was very huge in the French Revolution and is kind of seen as really the beginning of the French Revolution in France. All right, let's listen to this one and see if we can say it. Primogeniture. Oh. Primogeniture. Oh. Primogeniture. Primogeniture. Did I get it? Primogeniture. Ah, sure. Primogeniture. So primogeniture. What this was, was when basically you would have the land that a family would own and it would all be given to the firstborn son. Uh, the firstborn child, the firstborn son, because it's so patriarchal society. And so basically that um, uh, if you were the secondborn son or a daughter, you'd be married off and you would not have access to the land. Uh, what's important during this era is at the end of the French Revolution, uh, they make laws that end primogeniture. Yep, that end primogeniture. Okay, let's move on to um, uh, the next word. Maroons were escaped uh, slaves, so escaped African people who were put into slavery, who escaped from Spanish-owned uh, plantations, Portuguese-owned plantations in Brazil, and in this era, it's going to become really important because in areas of the Caribbean, especially in Haiti, Maroons will form their own societies and then will join up in a rebellion and revolution against the French who rule there. So these Maroon societies are Africans who were able to escape slavery and were able to form their own societies in the Americas. All right, we are looking at peninsulares, crios, and mestizos. These are all part of the Las Castas system that was a way of classifying people in the Americas. Peninsulares were Spanish people who were actually born in Spain and they were on top of the pyramid. Criollos or criollos were people of Spanish ancestry who were born in the Americas. And mestizos were people who were born of Spanish and Native American, uh, Native American Indian parents and were mixed race. These were three of the groups that existed in uh, the Las Castas system in the Americas. Zionism is a movement for originally establishing the development of a Jewish nation in the land which is called Israel today. Uh, Jewish people had to leave the land of Israel. Uh, the Romans kicked them out of there and they were not leaving there for hundreds and hundreds of years and they had faced discrimination and would be called anti-Semitism or racism against Jewish people for hundreds of years and we've gone over many examples of it. Zionism was the belief that the Jewish people needed to have their own country, their own land, their own state and needed to keep it up in the modern land of Israel. And today we can see that there is a modern nation of Israel that exists as a Jewish homeland. The Social Contract, which was written by Rousseau, who was a French uh, intellectual writer. And the basic idea of the Social Contract is that um, society, having a society and having a government is an agreement that citizens make. Citizens are willing to give up some of their rights, but they will give this up because the government will basically protect them. So basically, citizens will give up certain rights and privileges to have protection under a state or um, a government where they live. However, it is the government's job to keep the people safe and to keep as many rights as possible for their citizens. The Age of Reason was written by Thomas Paine, an American, and this is a philosophy that supports deism, or the belief that there's a God, but God doesn't really intervene into our lives. It is just our job to be moral, to try to live a good life, to try to follow the natural laws of reason that God established um, in our time that we have. This is written by Thomas Paine, another one of the Enlightenment thinkers, and many people would have seen it as going against current religions that existed in Europe at that time. The Declaration of Independence was written by Thomas Jefferson, it was written in, at that time, the British colonies as they declared themselves independent and would become the United States of America. And this is one of the revolutions that we saw as the Declaration pretty much said that uh, the United States of America had a right to be free from England because England was taking away their rights. One of the biggest things the Declaration of Independence says is that uh, it uses many ideas of the Enlightenment and it says that if people take up a government will not protect your rights, 
it is the duty of people to overthrow and get rid of that government and start a new one that will protect their rights. So much of this is influenced by the social contract by Rousseau and also enlightenment ideas by a thinker named John Locke um, in its writings. The United States Constitution was also written at this time and the Constitution inside of it did a lot of pretty amazing things for this time. Uh, it had the separation of powers, which we'll talk about next. Um, it also uh, pretty had, it had in it a Bill of Rights or rights that were guaranteed to people um, who are living in the United States. Not only that, what's really amazing about the United States Constitution, especially for this time, is that it allowed amendments to be made. So we could change or alter or make the Constitution even better. And amendments can still happen today. We can still change our Constitution if we feel like we need to. First word, separation of powers here. Separation of power, like this says, divides a government into independent branches. So instead of having one person or one part that's powerful, there are three parts. And this separates the power so no one has too much. You have an executive in the United States, which is the president. You have the legislative, which is the lawmakers or Congress. And you have the judicial, who are the judges who interpret the law. And the purpose of this is to make sure that nobody has too much power. Let's get to our next word, which is checks and balances. Checks and balances means that uh, one form of the government cannot become too powerful. So here's how checks and balances works. It is basically any branch of this government, there's three branches, they can stop each other. For example, <coughs> legislative job is to pass laws, but the president can veto them. Um, legislative branch brings up laws, the president has to sign them for them to become laws, so they have to work together. However, if these laws are declared illegal or don't follow the U.S. Constitution, the judges over here in the judiciary can say, nope, that doesn't work. That goes against the Constitution. So basically what we have here is that all these branches can stop each other. How do the judges get their job? The legislators have to pick them, and the president, oh, sorry, my bad, my bad. The president picks them, the president nominates them, and then people in what's called the Senate, part of the legislative, have to approve them. And then they have their job there. So here's the big deal with um, uh, checks and balances. Balances. Any part of the government can stop each other. This is going against having like a king or having even like Congress or Parliament or having one institution that has the power. All three of these can stop each other if it is working correctly with checks and balances. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen was primarily written by Robespierre in the time of the French Revolution. This was basically a declaration that gave rights to all the people who lived in France, regardless of their class, regardless of what estate they were in, first, second, or third. And it was pretty much the, um, uh, the declaration that announced what the French Revolution was all about and what the goals were for all people in the revolution.